Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'm going to speak to what I would call a subset of forensic misconduct. And I'm going to assume that all the law that's been provided to you in pleadings as well as emails, you know. You don't need me to tell you what the law is. So I want to just set up how the disqualification and then dismissal of the indictment should take place under the subset of forensic misconduct. Roman's counsel, this merchant, filed on January 8th her pleading, her motion to dismiss and to disqualify. We were in court that Friday of that week in which I made it known that we, that is President Trump, may adopt that motion. I waited to see, wanted to see what was going to happen before I did so. That Sunday, which would be January the 14th, 2024, D.A. Willis took it upon herself to go to a historic black church in Atlanta, having not responded at all to the motion of Ms. Merchant's client, Roman. And she made what we now call the church speech. And Your Honor has reference to that. Uh, you didn't necessarily want evidence on that, but you know what the church, spe church speech was. It was videoed. It was clear that Ms. Uh, Willis had notes. She was reading from notes that she had prepared. It was a calculated determination by Ms. Willis to prejudice the defendants and their counsel. How so? By making an issue out of the fact that the person that was challenged in the Roman motion was black. Without telling the public or the church members or anyone for that matter that the reason that Mr. Uh, Wade was being challenged was not because he was black, had nothing to do with race. It had to do with the relationship that had been alleged and later admitted to by Ms. Merchant. Ms. Willis took full opportunity to prejudice the defendants and then comes along later in a pleading and says it wasn't designed or intended to be at the defendants at all or the defense counsel, which with all due respect is just nonsense. The purpose of that was to get public sympathy, public empathy for what Ms. Merchant had already alleged in her motion. Now, that was a violation of the professional rules of conduct. It was a violation of 3.8 G. There's no question about it. It wasn't in response to anything that was said. It was a public statement, extrajudicial, for the purpose of making a comment upon the defendants. It would, it would be in response to a motion that was filed. But it wasn't filed in a response, in a pleading. It was filed in response to a motion. And the motion were allegations made. As I, if Ms. Willis wanted to respond at that point, she could have said the facts of the matter. Instead, she misstated what the, re, the situation was, took advantage of the opportunity, an ethical violation. And the ethical violation makes it clear that you must refrain from making extrajudicial comments that have a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemnation of the accused. Can you think of anything more that would heighten public condemnation of the defendants than alleging that defense counsel and the defendants were making their motion based on race and religion? That's as bad as it gets in Fulton County, with all due respect. That's exactly, that's exactly what Ms. Willis wanted done. And remember, the state still had not responded. So then what we get from the state is we get an affidavit filed as part of their response. And that affidavit says specifically, and the affidavit is Mr. Wade, says specifically in paragraph 26 and 27, 
that the relationship did not begin until 2022. It acknowledges the relationship and says it didn't begin until 2022. And the pleading that's filed, the state's pleading and response, indicates not exactly that, but it says there was no relationship as of November 1 of 2021, and that's on page 7. So now we know that timing is the issue because <coughs> Ms. Merchant made it clear that we alleged and had evidence that, that indicated the timing was before Mr. Wade was hired, not after. So the state now has filed an affidavit and a pleading that claims post hiring into 2022. And then Mr. Wade will us testify to the same thing under oath. Now, Ms. Yerti says it began in 2019. Why would she know? Well, she would know because she was a former friend. I know the state's going to get up here and say you can't believe, essentially what they're going to say is you can't believe any defense witness because they're defense witnesses. And only people that would tell the truth would be Wade and Willis. I suggest to you that that's not accurate. I suggest that the testimony that Mr. Wade gave and Ms. Willis gave, and I'm specifically dealing now with the timing issue without getting into anything else, that that brought forth a true concern about their truthfulness and being what is required of a lawyer in this state, which is candor toward the tribunal. And that's 3.3 of the professional rules. Specifically, um, small a, one, make a false statement of material fact or law to a tribunal. So that's, as I posited to the court, that's the second ethical violation and then you also have 8.4 of the professional rules that says it's a violation of the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct for a lawyer to, and that's A4, engage in a professional conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. Now, do you have to find that Wade and Willis lied? No. What you need to be able to find is that there is a concern, a legitimate concern based on the evidence in this case about their truthfulness. A legitimate concern about the truthfulness, which equates to an appearance of impropriety. Because once you have the appearance of impropriety under forensic misconduct, the law in Georgia is clear, that's enough to disqualify. So, why should you find there's a concern? with their truthfulness. Yerti is the first one. <clears throat> you have that testimony. But then we go to what is the most obvious indication that Willis and Wade were not truthful on the point of timing, and that's Bradley. Defense Exhibit 26 came into evidence. Defense Exhibit 26 comes in and says, and you know I went into this the last hearing, it says that on January the 5th, 2024, at approximately 9.49 a.m., there's text messages that are exchanged between Ms. Merchant and Mr. Bradley. And the text messages go like, just date, and that's from Ms. Merchant. Ms. Merchant says, do you think it started before she hired him, Bradley, who we now know from Defense Exhibit 39 has been texting with Ms. Merchant for a number of months. This is not the first time. This is months within the, the, the communications between the two. Mr. Bradley says, absolutely. Now, absolutely is not a speculative word. That's not speculation. That's a definitive statement. And Bradley then, unprompted, <clears throat> as this, and unprompted is important. It started when she left the DA's office and was a judge in South Fulton. It goes on, Ms. Merchant says, or he, she liked it started when she left the DA's office with the appropriate um, emoji or whatever one would call it to say it was liked. And then Ms. Bradley, Mr. Bradley said they met at the Municipal Court CLE conference. Again, unprompted. 
He's now definitively telling Ms. Merchant when this relationship started. Ms. Merchant says, that's what I figured when he was married. And then Ms. Merchant says, and we're now talking about a couple hours later, she texts and says, upon information and relief, Willis and Wade met while both were serving as magistrate judges and began a romantic relationship at that time. And Mr. Bradley responds, no, municipal court, thank you. Doesn't say it didn't start then. He doesn't suggest that she's wrong other than magistrate court municipal. Now we have that, and it's in evidence. And what does Bradley do? He knows that he's put himself in a position that if he testifies truthfully on the witness stand, your honor is in a position to be able to find, if you choose to, that both Willis and Wade lied. So what does Bradley do? Look, you are an assistant U.S. attorney. You know how this works when you have witnesses in this situation. Mr. Bradley did everything he could possibly do to evade answering questions. No recollection, couldn't remember, it was speculation. Anything he could possibly say that would cause your honor not to believe that Bradley knew when this relationship started. I suggest they were clear cut lies and the truth is in Defense Exhibit 26. And so if we take that view, that he thoroughly impeached himself, that he did not give truthful conduct, uh, well, you know, what's left standing? Generally, you would see someone who's impeached, perhaps we have some kind of core that you could point back to and say that's the time he was telling the truth. In these text messages, is it ever definitively shown how he knew this and that he actually did know it, other than in just a assertion outright, absolutely. Usually, if a state has a witness that goes sideways, they've got them locked in, they've sat down with a detective, they've got a full statement. We don't have that here. Well, what you have is a text message, which is a prior statement of Bradley that he did on his own that was not given to him by someone else. The only thing that the court has just noted is how do we know he wasn't speculating? Because you don't have to accept the fact that he wasn't speculating. The cases that I provided, I think by email yesterday, the first um, dealing with that, you can disbelieve that testimony and draw a negative inference. That's the Ferguson case. On Lee, the other case, you can simply take the prior inconsistent statement as substantive evidence. It has the same value. And that's what I'm asking you to do, to take what was the unprompted statement in Defense Exhibit 26 of Bradley and take that on its face, face value, that that is an indication that Bradley in fact knew and had said he did. If you accept that, you have to have concerns about the truthfulness of Willis and Wade on the timing issue. And, and I don't know if this is something maybe one of your co-counsel were going to address as well. We heard about kind of the law that, that applies that we're, we're outside kind of the orbit of, of the core of cases we're used to dealing with here where it deals with side switching or uh, where someone is in the uh, relationship, the client relationship. The proposition you're putting forward now is that if a representative of the state, the lead prosecutor, the district attorney themselves, um, says something that's untruthful on the record, that is something that immediately has to be proactively policed by the trial court. Is uh, Basically what I'm getting at is where in the law do we find the remedy to an untruthful statement? Generally, we send you down the street to the bar, right? And that's why I gave you the cases of Registe and Edwards yesterday. While those aren't prosecutorial cases or dealing with prosecutors, they deal with counsel. And in both those cases, the trial judge found ethical violations on the part of <clears throat> defense counsel or potential ethical violations. Went through the ethical violations and said, based on that, you're disqualified. You cannot be the attorney of record in this case. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If defense counsel can be kicked off of a case because of ethical violations, I suggest the same thing can happen for prosecutors when the ethical violations deal with truthfulness, candor to the court, extrajudicial statements, uh, 
those are the things that this court can rely upon and say, based on those, again, I find an appearance of impropriety. Where, where would be the limiting principle? Uh, the district attorney signs every indictment assigned to this courtroom. Does no, that mean she's off every case? No, it would be when the... If I found that she's untruthful, is that what you're kind of suggesting? You don't have to find, again, I'm not saying you have to find she was untruthful or that Wade was untruthful. You don't have to make a finding of fact that they lied. All you have to do is make a finding of fact that you have genuine, legitimate concerns about their credibility, about their truthfulness. And once you find that, then you can apply Registe and, and uh, Edwards. Well, but it's the same principle, though. If I have genuine concerns about her truthfulness on a particular occasion, how do those not spill over into every criminal case a district attorney brings? Well, it's because she testified under oath, and so did Mr. Wade. They didn't have to testify falsely. They could have testified truthfully. They could have indicated that the relationship, the timing, was in fact before Mr. Wade was hired. They chose not to. And in that sense, that dishonesty, that constitutes a violation of their ethical responsibilities. This is not signing an indictment. This is not filing a pleading in which both sides have their own positions. This is a requirement that every witness has to tell the truth under oath. And if they don't tell the truth under oath, or there's a significant concern about their credibility, then they're violating their ethical rules. And as anyone will tell you, as Your Honor already knew from when you were a prosecutor, prosecutors are held to a higher standard. They're the ones that are supposed to be seeking justice. They don't have a particular, they're supposed to be disinterested. When you have the lead prosecutor and the DA giving what I suggest to you is uh, untruthful testimony based on what Yerti has said, based on what Bradley said in his text, based on the whole way it was presented to you. Bradley didn't want to testify. He first came up with his attorney-client privilege thing on that. And Your Honor was, fortunately, went into that. And then when Bradley knew he had to testify about it, you saw what happened. You can draw the inference, as I've suggested on Bradley, that what he said in the text message, Defense Exhibit 26, is true. The relationship, in fact, started prior to November 1st of 2021. That ERT says that. And now, without getting into any detail, the cell phone records. The cell phone records show that during that period of time from, let's say, April 1 of 2021 to November 1st, I'm sorry, November 30th of 2021, that there was a number, a considerable number, 35 or more um, occasions where it appeared that, based on the records, that Mr. Wade was down in the area where Ms. Willis was staying in the Air Chief's apartment. But more important is there are two occasions, and the state has not challenged those. There are two occasions where the records reflect that it appears Mr. Wade spent the night at that apartment. <coughs> the state may say, we don't accept that. But they didn't challenge it. And even when they brought forth what they brought forth today, Supplemental 2 and 3, they didn't challenge it again. So what does that suggest? That's corroborating evidence of what Yerte had said, of what Bradley said in his text message. It's also uh, impeachment evidence as to what Wade and Willis said about how many times. Is that a significant, in terms of just the the times. Didn't Mr. Wade testify that he was there at least 10 times during that time frame? You've Which, now found 35. Well, minimum of 35. Okay. But never overnight. He said he but, never spent overnight. Put that to the side, though, just in terms of the fact that he did say he'd been over there, that he'd visited the place, uh, and I would presume he wasn't obviously keeping a, a, a very good accounting of it, but he, that wasn't something that was entirely denied. I, I, if you're asking me do we win on the point that he said more than 10 or around 10 and we say 35? Do we win on that point? Sure. No. Okay. It's not determined. The overnight rate might raise some more concerns. I understand. Yeah, it does. And that's the reason why we highlighted it in the affidavit of Mr. Middlestaff, because that is suggestive that they were not being honest to the court. So then, how much time have I used? Have I? Yeah. I'm letting them use the hook. So, uh, suggestive. Again, raising issues I'm wondering about burden. 
uh, is that we're dealing with a preponderance standard? We are dealing with a preponderance standard, and it's our burden. Yeah. No question about that. So but, does suggestive get us there? No, but it is corroborating evidence of evidence that we did put up. And that's what the purpose of the cell phone records. They corroborate what Yerti says. They corroborate what Bradley said in Defense Exhibit 26. And they impeach, to that extent, Wade and Willis's testimony. So if you find by a preponderance of the evidence, so I can finish this up, if you find by a preponderance of the evidence that my, what I call subset of forensic misconduct, ethical violations, has been shown, and that there is a significant and legitimate concern about the truthfulness of Wade and Willis, they're disqualified. Now, obviously, the factual findings are yours, but the law allows you to do that. You don't have to do it through an actual conflict. That's the other side of the equation. And that's what I've argued, and I think that's what Mr. Gibbons can argue. Before I let you go, though, uh, uh, this is an interesting classification. You're saying forensic conduct isn't just pub com commenting publicly about the case indicating guilt. You're saying forensic conduct is just anything a district attorney says. No. Falls under that box? No. I'm, I'm saying that, Improper, that forensic misconduct as a subset of that would include violations, ethical violations, which impact the ability of the defendants to get a fair trial, as well as impact the court's ability to have faith that the prosecutors, these two prosecutors, are acting in good faith in their own conduct. Same idea dealing with, as I said, defense counsel in the two cases I mentioned. Ethical violations can give rise to disqualification, and I suggest we have that here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sena. Thank you.